And here we go. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which you have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, um, ho hold on to what you have. Hold on to what you have. I will not put any other burden on you. He says, hold on to what you have. This church he praised in the beginning and then there was a kind of a cancer working in it. And he says, okay, you're doing pretty good. Hold on to what you have until I come. You know, that's what we have to do. We go through long periods of trial. But when you're in the middle of a trial, just remember that, hold on. Sometimes it's very difficult. Sometimes it seems like you're being drawn on God's bow until you're going to crack. But he'll come. Eventually he will come. Eventually he will come. To us it seems like an eternity. But I tell you, he does not fail. If you don't quit, eventually he will come. To him who overcomes... And does my will to the end. You know, it's interesting as we have gotten into this problem of the relationship of our behavior to our salvation, the part that our behavior plays, of course, is brought out in this idea of overcoming. But as uh, I've been holding forth on this, it's very interesting. I, a gentleman that used to hear us on the radio sent me a study that he's done, and I gave it to Earl. You have it in there, along with the scriptures on grace. And he's gone back to uh, study Luther. He's in a contest with a society called the General, no, the Grace Evangelical Society. And the Grace Evangelical Society states this. This is their statement. Moral transformation is not necessary for salvation. Moral transformation, that is a change, is not necessary for salvation. And so this fellow of mine, he's been here, Brother Helwig or something like that, Sons of Assembly of God minister, uh, he, he's been here in this church and he really loves what I teach. And he's gone back and he's researched this doctrine of how it got started, who said what about it, that grace is a thing that operates outside of your behavior. And I gave all the study to Earl. He's, he's quite a scholar, this fellow. But the interesting thing of it is, is that this has been a long-standing dialogue, a long-standing controversy in the Christian church. This is not new. This is not new. This idea that... Uh, Grace is something that operates out here, whether you are transformed morally or whether you are not, has nothing to do with salvation. Of course, the problem there is that salvation is transformation. See, he's implying that he's, talk, he's thinking about heaven. See, when you say that salvation operates independently of moral transformation, then you're defining salvation as not a new creature, but as going to heaven. That's what he means by salvation. So it's very interesting that we're not wrestling with this alone. So we know that the Christian church, as far as the blood atonement is concerned, is correct. 
There's no salvation other than through the blood of Jesus. And we know that the church has held out for the fact that we must be baptized in water, which is true. They've held out for the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And after that, everything that's been built on it is cockeyed. And I, Earl and I have been discussing this. And, it's, and, and the more you get into this, it's just like we're going to have to restructure the whole thinking of people concerning what salvation is. Because this grace thing has, is so widespread. It is so widespread that if you even mention a thought of overcoming to mean that there's something that you have to do something, that it's not just believing and saying Jesus is Lord, you have left the evangelical movement because they say, well, we ought to do good, but if we don't, it's, we're still saved anyway in the sense of going to heaven. So we have confusion in definition. Then we have another problem, and, I, and I've been very concerned, and I've expressed this concern before, that I know God is going to move on the Jews, and I know he's going to pour out his spirit and lift his, uh, the, the blindness from Israel, and when he does, the rabbis are going to be very vulnerable. They're, they're going to say, we've been wrong. Then they're going to be ripe for all these garbage, in fact, I, when I was giving my DOS name to this thing I'm writing, I just see each DOS has an eight-letter name and then a three-letter extension for your file. I just call it garbage <laughs> because that's what it is. And all this garbage is going to, and the rabbis will be wiped out because they'll realize we've been wrong for 2,000 years. And so I've been concerned about this for a number of years, and I've been praying that God will defend the Jews from Western traditions because all this is Western traditions. It's not Christianity. Our church architecture, our liturgies, the priest and people, all the mumbo-jumbo, the ringing of bells and the statues, and all of this is Western tradition. It has nothing to do with Jesus. And I'm hung up because I can't get a good term for it because you can't use Christianity. So it's involved, and I'm studying on this. So I was talking to Frank Eichler yesterday and uh, it's amazing how our brains run together. And we were talking about something altogether different. He said, I'm going to have you up again. He says, you know, did anybody ever tell you you grow on people? And I said, not usually. <laughs> but anyway, he says, he says, well, you're growing on me. I've got to have you up again. And he says, what we've got to talk about is getting through to the Jews without all this stuff. And I said, man, you are on. So we've got two big problems. And it seems like in such a small church, you know, that we're just talking nonsense, nothing's ever going to happen. Listen, the history of the world shows if somebody comes up with something right, it eventually prevails. Yeah. You know, whether it's the world is round or man can fly or whatever it is, or you can lay the transatlantic cable, if somebody believes it enough and it's right, it will go no matter what anybody else says. So we're at a place now where the whole body of the Messiah, and Earl, this is very practical, this is not nonsense, it's not academia out here somewhere. Earl has been teaching this to the Mexican people and they are getting it. They're getting it. They're actually getting it. And God is choosing Mexico for some reason. Uh, I have a friend who's gone down into Monterey and it's a very tough section. And he preached in a brothel. Do you know, do I have to use more graphic terms? Anyway, there was a madam who uh, became converted and became a Christian. <laughs> she turned her house into a church. So he's been <laughs> preaching in this brothel down in, uh, and we took every book that we've translated into Spanish, 10 copies of each, and gave them to him to pass out in Monterey. And he says they loved it, and he's getting invitations to come back. So God is speaking to Mexican people. You see, somewhere the thing will ignite in Christian people, it will hit them. Our whole structure of belief, what we've been believing here, not the atonement, not the resurrection, but this idea that grace is something that takes you to heaven uh, is wrong. It's not what the Bible is teaching. So it is working. It is going. And the books are there and the tapes are there and people are beginning to see it. Praise the Lord. Now our next responsibility 
is Israel. We've got to get the information graphically and clear to where it can be presented to the Jewish people before God pours out his spirit on them. So that, they, so that the rabbis, well, they may not believe it now, but it'll be there. And the Holy Spirit will have to do some of this. <laughs> and it'll be there, and they'll say, no, that doesn't mean we have to become Catholic. Because, see, many Jews believe that, that to become a Christian, you have to become a Catholic. Did you know that? No, we don't have to do that. That's what it says. It's in this book. It says we don't have to fear the Catholics. That's, that's not where it is, or all this Western garbage, or prosperity, or faith, or the rapture, or we're being left down here. None of this is true. We can have our own bread. It is ours without any of this stuff. Amen. Hallelujah. So keep praying, because it's working. It's going. We'll be presenting that over the radio. God is opening doors, so, and other doors, too, so that we can get the books and the tapes and the information. And when that hits enough people, it will ignite and it will change the thinking of the whole Christian church. You wait and see. It may sound like braggadocio. I'm not, I don't have time for that. I'm too old. I don't care anything about that. But I care about truth and I see it and it's true and this gray stuff has wrecked the church. It's wrecked the church. Man, man saying you can be saved apart from moral transformation is absolutely nuts. But anyway, that's more people believe that than don't. So here we have it. So I'm calling your attention to that because of the scripture passage that you're on. So you hear, see it clearly. You see it? That's nothing to do with grace. To him who overcomes and keeps my works to the end. See, to him, the person that does it. How many see that? <clears throat> you see the difference? We're not talking about faith. We're not talking about believing. We're talking about taking, demonstrating your faith by living for Jesus, and we live for Jesus by the grace that God has given us. Grace is not forgiveness alone. Grace is the presence of God to enable us to overcome and to hang on. Do you see the difference? Now, I went through my computer, and Earl wanted a copy of every, every time grace is used in the New Testament. I, on a computer, I was able to give him a print out of that, Every verse in the New Testament that uses the word grace, a printout, which I gave him tonight, it's about, took me about 10 minutes. That's the beauty of the computer. You try that with your Strong's Concordance. All I have to do is find the verse, hit a button, it prints it out, hit another button, just the next verse on grace, hit a button, it prints it out like that. About 10 minutes, I had every verse in the New Testament with the word grace, and there's a lot of them. And see, when you take all these verses and say, that's my definition of grace, what all these verses say, which is the inductive process, then you don't have it meaning forgiveness. It means all the ways in which it's used, which is a much more comprehensive definition. So we're on it, we're working, it's moving, and God's going to do it, and you won't be yelled at forever. All right, now, only hold on... In fact, Earl's been trying to deal with people. He says, now I know why you yell and scream in frustration. <laughs> All right. Only hold on to what you have until I come. So there's, it's a fight. It's a battle. How many can see that implicit in there? You see, if God, now I don't know what your state is tonight, but I'm sure many of you have things that you're holding on to by your teeth. See? And the Bible's talking to you. And it's saying, hold on. Don't quit. Hold on. Hold on, hold on. And then that voice comes along. Oh, it isn't as hard as that. Hey, you're all, it is my buddy here. I've got a friend in uh, suffering here. All right. And to everybody else, let me say, you know what the modern tendency is? If you have problems with the law, change the law. If you have problems with politics, change the government. If you have problems with your religion, change the Bible. See, that's what we're doing. See? Oh, is that hard? Oh, God doesn't want it to be that hard. See? If you have problems with the law, change the law. If you have problems with politics, change the government. If you have problems with your salvation, change the scripture. You shall not surely die. How many know that? How that's how psychologists deal with guilt? Did you know that? They can not tell you what you did is okay. Huh? If you have problems with your conscience, change your standards. 
That's today's resolution. Anything bothers you, don't you change. Change it. Change whatever's stressing you. So what God is saying to us is not that at all. He's not saying uh, just uh, I want it to be easy for you and pleasant. He's saying hold on. If you will overcome, if you will call upon my grace, if you will stand, certain things will come to pass. Do him who overcomes and does my will to the end. How long? You never quit. You never quit. You never quit. You never quit. Because we don't know how long long is. We just know the Lord said to do it, so we do it. And if it's our whole life, amen. It's nothing compared to what's coming. He says, I will give authority over the nations. Now, okay. Now help me with this thing. I bet my mind has been on, on original Christianity. I'm trying to get down to the basic structure of it before it went off. And I'm trying to put myself in the Jew's mind to think how he's thinking. Because the way we, the reason it's so scrambled is because we don't have a Jewish orientation. So we're not oriented to the kingdom, we're not oriented to our righteousness, we general, Gentiles come in, we're oriented toward heaven, which is not scriptural. So I've been doing a lot of thinking, trying to get my brain back to original Christianity. What was originally right? And, and I've been studying a lot on the, uh, pro on the early prophecies. Have you ever done that? Going back to uh, Luke, they're in Luke. The prophecies that, that came in the beginning about what Christianity was. The first one, um, the first one is in Luke 1.11. I've been reading these because they give you a feeling for what the original concept was. What did God mean when he instituted the religion of Jesus? The divine salvation. What was God thinking of? It's been so larded over with traditions, we're thinking of it in an unusual way. All right, then if you have Luke 1, 11, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Now look at verse 16. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. So it's original in inception. The gospel is to the Jew. See that? See the original prophecy? That's how it came. All right. To turn, and notice this, he will go on, speaking of John, on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedience to the wisdom of the righteous. Now, you see, when we think about Christianity, when we think about our salvation, we think, oh, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. Uh, I, I have to uh, believe that Jesus is my Savior and Jesus is my Lord, and then I will, and I'll be baptized in water, and then I will be saved. Okay, There's, that's in the gospel also. But look at this. How many times did you ever hear this preach? The reason that Jesus came, the reason that uh, John came was to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. See, that's Malachi. That's very important with God. And that is what God is doing in this church. If you look back three years ago, it was three or four years ago, we began to pray that God would take out this cursed generation gap. And you know what he's you know what he's using to do it? Dancing. The last thing in the world that we would have ever thought of. But God knows how little people act, and they act physically. That's how they understand, is in physical movement. And I look at them, some are dancing gracefully, some of them are hopping up and down. 
It doesn't matter. They're not sitting there coloring. They're entering in. And, and we need to keep reminding them they're worshiping the Lord because to some of them it's just a uh, galley morphry, you know. They're just hopping around. That doesn't matter. It'll come. The point is they are participating. And see, that's part of the original gospel. And the disobedient, to turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. Can you see its moral transformation from the beginning? It's moral transformation from the beginning. Right? All right. Zechariah and so on and Gabriel, and et cetera. So that was Gabriel, a pretty highly placed man there. <clears throat> All right. And then in verse 24, Elizabeth became pregnant. And then in verse 26, uh, Gabriel came to Mary. All right. Let's see now. Uh, all right. Now notice in verse 31, you will be with child and give birth to a son. This is Luke 1, 31. And are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. Now notice verse, the next verse, the next sentence. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. The Lord God will give him the throne. Now, that, I want you to remember that because the, the concept of the kingdom is very basic to Christianity, but it's all been lost in this rapture heaven thing. And all this garbage, when, when you put it in your DOS file, label it garbage. That's exactly what it is. It's garbage. It has nothing to do with heaven and bells tinkling and saints and holy angels flying around harps and golden slippers. It has to do with the rule of God. And you see, we're reading, to him that overcomes, well, I do what? I'll give authority over the nations. And I wanted to give you a background for that because we can't even hear that. And you didn't even hear it when it was read. I know you didn't hear it. I can hardly hear it myself. It means nothing. I thought, when well, you come to people with needs and, and in the first century it's the Jews, what are you talking about? What kind of a promise is this? It doesn't even relate to people or their needs. What do you mean rule over the nations? Nobody ever talks about rule. They talk about acres of diamonds, mansions, golden slippers. See, we're not, we don't understand why ruling over nations has anything to do with anything. Nor are you interested in it, I'm sure. And the only reason I'm preaching it is because it's what the Bible says. So I'm showing you at the beginning to Mary when she was pregnant. In the very beginning, he, he's speaking of something that means nothing to us Gentiles. Okay? It means nothing to us Gentiles. The throne of his father David. You never heard that preach in evangelistic service in your life. It doesn't mean anything to us. But God is bringing us back to realize that what the gospel of Jesus Christ is about is the restoration of the throne of David. Now there was a time on this earth in terra firma when a man named David ruled. And he ruled in the fear of God. And you can see how far we've come from that. I mean, this was a man whose whole life was God. One of the greatest kings of history. One of the most warlike kings of history. One of the most successful kings of history. And he was absolutely a righteous man walking in the fear of God. Can you see what, how wonderful it would be if we could have a rule over the world like David? And we say, yeah, but the church and state are supposed to be separated. No, they're not. They're supposed to be one and the same. And when David ruled, there was no separation between church and state. David ruled in the power of the Holy Spirit and with the wisdom of God. God told him how to fight battles. And so when the virgin is with child, they don't go through all these things and all the Gentiles are being harped, playing harps and wearing slippers. He shall restore the throne of David. Do you see what I mean by having to rebuild it from the ground up? After we get past the resurrection of Christ, the whole thing is Western tradition. 
Our church architecture, our steeples, our steeples go back to an ungodly thing. See, they, they didn't originate with Christianity. They originated with the obelisks. And I don't want to go any further into obelisks. But the things we do, the, the thing of the mother and the child has appeared in something like 22 religions. All of that is tradition. It's garbage. God's going to rebuild. God is rebuilding. Hallelujah. The throne of his father David. That's what Gabriel said. The throne of his father David. All right. Now notice. The Lord God and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Now, you see what, what Christians are doing in the replacement of saying, yeah, but we have to spiritualize that to make it mean Christians. Do you believe that, that that's what the Holy Spirit is saying? This is really a spiritual term for Christian. Then what's David? What does that represent spiritually? You know? This means Jacob. It means Israel after the flesh. Uh, of course, they have to be born again. He will reign over the house of Jacob. His kingdom... His kingdom will never end. So this is what, that's why in, in the Revelation 2, when we read, he that overcomes will I grant to rule the nations, is of the very essence of Christianity. That's what Christianity is about. Now, do you see what I mean? How wonderful it will be if we can get into writing and get on tapes this message to the Jews so that when the Holy Spirit comes on them and the blindness is lifted, they'll be able to see, hey, this has nothing to do with becoming a Gentile. It has to do with the throne of David. It has to do with the house of Jacob. We'll be coming to another verse in a minute that makes it even more clear. All right. Now we get down to Mary's song. <coughs> Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. Um, verse 46, the Magnificat. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And so on. All right. Now, let me get down. Verse 54. He has helped his servant Israel. Remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Now, the, the real uh, powerful one is Zechariah's song, and it begins in verse 68. Now, what I'm showing you is in the origin, in the origin of Christianity, what it was before it became all cluttered up with the Gentile tradition. Um, Luke 1, 68, Zechariah's song, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. Of course, he was thinking of Jews at the time. All right. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Do you know that one reason that the Jews have never been able to relate to Christianity is because they cannot understand grace. See, they picture, they picture anything that has to do with God as having to do with righteousness. And when you come in, and, and I told you about the incident that happened where there, was, there were some Jews listening to a lecture by a former concentration camp guard, a Nazi. And he was telling how he had been born again, how he had received Jesus, and all his sins were gone. And the Jews were listening, and they said, do you mean to tell us that all of our friends and relatives that died in the Holocaust are burning in hell, and you, are, you who were responsible for it are going to heaven with God. And he said, that's right. And they said, we choose to go with our relatives. See, they cannot comprehend that. Because they're looking for righteousness. And, by, and we have taken grace and we have made it a substitute for righteousness. They cannot understand that. Now, if that guard had got up and had said, I have done all these evil things, 
And I may have to pay for them for the rest of my life because God is a righteous God. And I have repented and God has sent me salvation through the blood of his son. And God will do the same for you and for those who have never heard of them. God will judge them righteously. They might have heard him if they could have forgiven him. But by presenting grace as some kind of a magic, this guy can, can chop little children to pieces and rape women and do all these things. And then he says the four steps and all of a sudden he's a saint on wheels. And some of the people in the ghetto that had never even heard the gospel, that had striven for righteousness all their days, were in the fires of hell, which is not scriptural. You see, they cannot relate that to anything they know about God. And it is in fact false. That is not how God works. Not how God works at all. When that, when that man who was a prison guard and had those memories in his life came to God, God would forgive him. That's absolutely true and absolutely scriptural. God will forgive anyone through the blood of Jesus. But I want you to know from then on, the things that he has done are still with him and they have to be dealt with by the Lord. Not they're forgiven. They're forgiven. But Christianity is not forgiveness. It is a new creation. And you see, he can be brought into paradise in that condition, but the, the righteousness, the thing that God is looking for, image and union, is not present at all. So this guard was giving them a, a simplistic, modern, evangelical concept of heaven. And of course, they could not relate to that. How could my rabbi, there was never anyone as godly in the world as my rabbi. He would take the clothes off his back to give to the poor. He prayed night and day. He gave alms. He did everything. He had never heard the gospel. He did not understand about Jesus. But what he did, he did. But he's burning in the flames of hell. And you just come out and say something and like that and sit in your Lutheran church and you're going straight to heaven. There's no way that a, that a Jew is going to relate to that. They have to hear it as it was preached in the beginning. It is not a simple thing. Nor was it preached as a simple thing in the book of Acts. They said, repent and bring forth works meet for repentance. <coughs> I never said, say the four steps and you're a shoe in and go to heaven. In fact, heaven was never the goal. All right, now he says in, in Zechariah, notice this carefully because this is the pure gospel here. Um, Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Now notice that. As he said, notice in verse 71, they saw salvation. Salvation was presented by the Holy Ghost through Zacharias, not as forgiveness, but salvation from the enemies and from the hand of those who hate us. And who is that today? Satan. 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 They didn't understand that then. They hadn't been born again. They were still looking at natural enemies. But that's what salvation is. It is to deliver us from Satan. To show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, see, purely Jewish, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us. Now notice this carefully, verse 74. This is the primal, original, ancient gospel of the Holy Ghost through the father of John the Baptist. And this is the way he defined it. To enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Nothing to do with grace. Nothing to do with forgiveness. Nothing to do with is my church meeting our need. Nothing to do with all the self-centered slop. And you, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Now, forgiveness of sins is included, and it is part of salvation. It's part. But I'm stressing the other because it's been the only thing. Because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. Now, there's another prophecy in here, and since I don't have my, um, com my computer, let me see another one. All right, now down in verse 29 of, ver of chapter 2 of Luke, there's another prophecy 
um, given by Simeon. Verse 31 of Luke 2. Uh, verse 30, For mine eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. A light for revelation to the Gentiles. How about that? And for glory to your people Israel. All right. And then Anna uh, spoke about redemption in Jerusalem. But there's one I ran across today. Does anyone know where it is that he would gather the children of God who are scattered abroad. Was that Caiaphas? That's in Matthew. Isn't it? Where's Caiaphas? Remember when Caiaphas prophesied? And they said it's better that one man die, not that the whole nation die. Where is that? Because there's something there. There's something there in Caiaphas prophecy I wanted to show you. It's very important. I did not intend to get it this time. It's where Caiaphas said it's better. And it says that he, this, he spoke not of himself, but being high priest, he prophesied. Anybody find out? There's a lot of mentions of Caiaphas here. Was it seemed to me it was in John? Well, I can't be right. I don't know, that cannot be right. spend time on it, only it's important to the concept. Uh, it is in John. Uh, John 11, uh, the passage is uh, verse 49. Uh, what you were talking about was verse 52. All right, John 11. Okay. I'm, I'm spoiled with the computer. I just hit the buttons and I'll get everything I want. Uh, John 11. Yeah. All right. All right. Now notice John, now notice John 11, 51. This is a remarkable verse. John 11, 51. Uh, he did not say this on his own, that it's better for one man to die for the people, that the whole nation perish. But be, as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. Isn't that something? Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. To, uh, and not only for that nation, but now notice this next very carefully, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. The scattered children of God. Now, that follows something in Acts that we don't often get into. But Paul spoke to Acts in one of the cities, and he said, don't mind what's happening, Paul. I have much people in this city. Now, if you think about that, it sounds as though God knows that this idea of being saved is not entirely something that you just go out and do, but God has people that belong to him in each city that are his. Now, that follows the parable of the wheat and the tares. Now, none of us would like to take that parable literally. But if you take the parable of the wheat and the tares literally and take what Jesus said about it, he said some of the people are in the world are of the devil and some are of God. That's what it says. Now, we always waltz around that and say, surely that couldn't be true. But if you take, if you read Matthew 13... It's, and read what about the parable of the wheat and the tares and read how Jesus interpreted that and just taking it off the top. He's saying that, that some of the people in the world are of God and some are of the devil. And he's not talking about after they get converted. He's talking about the way they were born. So you do with that as you will. I don't push it because it's, you know, this kind of thing. And I like people to feel they have a choice, and we do. But... Nonetheless, this is a very remarkable prophecy by Caiaphas. 
See, he didn't say for the Gentiles which are scattered abroad, but I think he was referring to Gentiles. It seems like he was referring to Gentiles, but he calls them the scattered children of God. Isn't that interesting? So it kind of sounds as though the main plump is Israel. There's no question about that. The gospel is to the Jew first. I mean, this is a very, it's not just kind of to the Jew first, or this is a nice saying. It is the children's bread. It is Jewish, okay? It is a Jewish redemption having to do with the throne of David and the house of Jacob. It's a Jewish redemption. The new covenant is made only with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob. It's never made with a Gentile. So what we have a picture of that the religion of Jesus, which I'm trying to get away from calling Christianity, Eichler will not stand for the term because Eichler, Eichler did his doctorate in Western uh, Theological Seminary and he did his doctorate on, and his PhD on uh, anti-Semitism. And he said he wept for seven years. He cried for seven years when he saw what the Gentiles had done to the Jews from the first century onward. And then what Luther did to the Jews and so on. He said he cried for seven years. Well, whether he did or not, that's probably a little drawn there. But anyway, the point is that he's very sensitive. And he, he says, I cannot go the term Christianity. So I, in my book, I've been trying to, and I do it You Are My People, I'm revising it and adding to it and trying to uh, I've referred to it as the religion of Jesus or the divine salvation. Very difficult to get a term other than Christianity. I'm cooking on it. So I'm trying to get away from that a little bit. But if you look at the religion of Jesus or the religion that came through Jesus and is based on Jesus, the salvation of God, it's Israel. And all this other garbage with our steeples and our churches and our liturgies and our pulpits and all this other stuff has no bearing on anything. It's just a human adaptation I'm not going to throw it all out. I'm not, you know, I'm not, and that's not where I'm going with this thing. I'm trying to get it correct, doctrinally correct in writing, so that when, when the Jews repent, and they will, according to the scripture, God's going to lift the blindness from them, they will have solid logic, solid scripture, that they can go back and look at the original prophecies, the original word of God, the way it came forth in the New Testament, and they will relate to it properly, whereas we Gentiles, not being kingdom-oriented, uh, uh, see, well, when you say to a Gentile, you rule over the nations, what does that mean to him? I mean, he can't even fit it. You know, you talk to him about heaven, he's thinking of a mansion. He's thinking of a peaceful place in a meadow, isn't he? You talk to a Gentile Christian about what's going to, where he's going, and he's going to a place of peace and joy where there's beauty and angels and his relatives and hopefully some trees and birds and things he recognizes and, and some kind of food to eat and a clean house without dust and uh, I mean, he's, you know, and he won't have to worry about being overweight and things. You know, whatever we associate, Hank wants to play golf. You know, it's whatever your thing is, that's who we associate. But you see, that is Gentile. And a Jew cannot relate to that. They do now. They do now talk about heaven. But you see, it's because they've been influenced. All right, now when you go into Acts, the first chapter, you can see the different orientation. Ready? You know, when I was in Watsonville some months ago, we're in Acts 1, we had a retreat there, a men's retreat. And I spoke at the retreat there. It was a Dennis McNally's retreat up in Watsonville. We had about 70 guys. There. A lot of the guys that came down were there. And uh, the music, the war, the marching, the leaping, and, and the, all the rest of it that went on at our retreat went on there. I mean, it was the same thing exactly. And what happened was, as I was walking from the place where I stayed, they had me off in a place separate. I wasn't with everybody. And they had me in a place. And when I would walk over toward where you could hear them all over the place, as you might imagine, that's why we can't have our women's retreat in a motel or something. There's a lot of nice motels on the coast. But you can imagine when that stuff starts up and all the drums and the bugles and everything else that isn't going to wash over in the beach terrace or Dana Point or something. It isn't going to go. You know. So anyway, all over this campground up in Watsonville, you know, the men marching and the drums and da-da-da, bang, crash, you know, and everybody's singing. 
70 men sing at the top of their lungs. And I passed on my left the mess hall, and they had another church group in there. <laughs> and the door was closed, and they were doing fine. They had one musician who was a trumpeter. He was playing the, the melody, and they were singing. And you know, it was when the saints come marching in. But the contrast, I mean, it was like going back to sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. I mean, it was just, it was another generation. I, I couldn't. And I looked in there, these were godly people. I mean, they were godly men. It was a men's group. They had a preacher. They were having a good time in there. They were preaching the gospel and praising the Lord when the saints come marching in. Brother, sister, it wasn't even in the same religion. I mean, this other had a... That's why I come back. You don't remember this. But I come back. I stood in the middle of the aisle by myself with my face hanging out like I do sometimes. You know, like I'm completely insensitive to people. And I'm saying, hail the king, hail the Lord. The Lord's about that mess. Everybody remember that? I couldn't remember the rest of the song, but I knew I had heard what I wanted to hear. So I just stood there singing, chanting that and everything. Larry's taking notes. And, <laughs> and now we're singing. And it's all about sounds in the valley and all this, and we sing like nothing. But I, that's where I heard that. When I heard just the drum and those men marching to a beat like Hogan's Heroes, and just the men just marching to that beat, I said, that is where I belong. <coughs> and not sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. But I realize, <laughs> but I realize, well, I'm saying that because I went and preached at Assembly of God Church a couple of years ago, and they're still singing Sunlight, Sunlight in My Soul today. I thought, what in the world? The world's going on from here. But anyway, I'm saying that to tell you something here about Acts 1. I haven't forgot what I'm doing. I'm old, but not gone. All right, now. Um, now, here is the resurrected Jesus in Acts Chapter 1, verse 1, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Spirit to the apostles, he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Now, why do you suppose he spoke about that? Remember, he shall give him the throne of his father, David. That is what the gospel is. And that is what the Jew is oriented toward. And that's why we Gentiles have got it all messed up, because we're not oriented toward the kingdom. That's, that's one of the root causes. <clears throat> he, now, he says, on one occasion, verse 4, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about, and so on. And then in verse 6, here's these Jews. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? See this? Now they're talking to the resurrected man here. Are you going to restore? Is this what you're going to do? We've been waiting for this. Are you going to do this? And notice Jesus' answer. Notice Jesus' answer very carefully. He shoved it to one side. He didn't say yes, and he didn't say no. He said, it is not for you to know the times or dates. The Father is set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he said this, he was taken up. Now, what did he do? He gave them something difficult to understand. See, they can understand the kingdom. They're thinking of Solomon. He had the greatest kingdom. You know, but, he, but Solomon built his kingdom on what David had accomplished. And it went from the Mediterranean to the Euphrates, not to the Jordan, but all the way east to the Euphrates. And that was the original commission. And David accomplished that. And then Solomon came in on, on it, but he couldn't hold it because of his sin. All right, now... That's what they're thinking, the day when we're going to rule this world. And Jesus told them something. They had no concept what he was talking about. And it was at this point that the church was born. The church, not the kingdom, but the church. They didn't understand about the concept of a church. The church is not an Old Testament concept. 
War, kingdom, but not church. Israel, priesthood, chosen, which is what the word church means, but they didn't use the term so much. But at this point, the Lord was talking about something they had no concept of. What does he mean? The Holy Spirit will be on us, will have power, will bear witness of what we've seen. Yeah, that makes sense, but it doesn't answer the question. So, the original gospel of the kingdom that was preached by John and was preached by Jesus and was prophesied in Isaiah and particularly in the book of Psalms took a back seat. And the apostles went out and they began to preach about Jesus and about the atonement and about his resurrection and the fact he was going to judge the world. And they spoke a little bit about the kingdom, but not much. Then when the apostles died and the spirit of revelation was gone, here you had these groups of people. The Jews were beginning to be ostracized as being the murderers of Christ. The Gentiles were coming in by the scads and there begin, you know, men begin to see uh, possibilities in the terms of rulership and in terms of status. The revelation was gone, so they begin to make adaptations of things. Finally, the priesthood came in and everything. That was 2,000 years ago. Over that period of time, the idea, what the gospel is about, has been lost. And everything is the church. Somewhere in those early days, probably about three or 400 AD, AD came in the idea that what this is all about is to go to live in the spirit realm. Somewhere that came in way back there. And then the church became an institution on the earth that men came to with the hope of saving their soul, meaning when they died they would go to heaven. So little by little, the, the idea of Christianity was gone. And then it began to be restored in the time of Luther, but a tiny bit. He still hated the Jews, but he had this little concept that the just shall live by faith to get away from the ecclesiastical structure of the Catholic Church. Then little by little, God has been adding, and at the turn of the century, it was tongues. And then after 1950, it was the body of Christ and the gifts of the Spirit, and that's where we are today. And God is bringing us back by revelation, and now the move is back to the kingdom. And so this struggle that people have had from the first century, what does grace mean? What does it mean? And back in the first century, they went into this era called antinomianism, and the idea is that God has come to the earth. He couldn't get men to live righteously, so he gave them grace, meaning you do not have to live righteously, that's not necessary because my goal is to bring you to heaven. See, this is a complete warping of the kingdom concept. Can you see that? Because the kingdom concept is not based on living in heaven, but based on the throne of David, okay? which is all righteousness, which is all godliness. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. How will we pray? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So here we are. 1992, close to the coming of the Lord. And what is he doing? He's coming. God, you know, the way God does things is enough to really scald you, you know, because you can't see it. He could have done it so much easier. But instead, he's allowed this tremendous mess to accumulate. And it has not an end yet. Out of, the, out of today's structure, there's going to come two primary groups one is going to be this holy remnant that we were singing about and blowing the trumpet. The real stuff. People that see the kingdom, see that they are the ones who were scattered abroad, but the bulk of it is on Israel, anxious to get back to Israel, anxious to become part of the kingdom, anxious to get Jesus back reconciled to his brothers, anxious to get the land and the kingdom and the rule of Jesus. And in the meanwhile, God is teaching them to rule by overcoming. Because you can't rule unless you overcome. Because if you cannot overcome the world and the lust of your flesh and your self-will, you are in no condition to rule. You see that? You don't rule by grace. You rule by what you are. It isn't a case of earning the right to rule. It's a case of the capacity to rule. So you don't go through school to become a dentist 
so that when you come out, you say, I went for four years, now I deserve a diploma. So give me a diploma. What does the four years do for you? It teaches you, it makes you confident. Overcoming, that's what people say, oh, you're into works, you're trying to earn it by works. It is not a case of earning anything. It is a case of competence. It is a case of learning to pull teeth. It is a case of learning what you're supposed to do. It's a case of learning to rule. And if we can't, if we can't through the grace of Jesus, and by that grace I mean his presence, his blood, his Holy Spirit, the born-again experience, the ministry, and all the graces and gifts and presence of God that the Lord has given us, if we can't, with all of this, gain the victory over the world and over our self-will and over sin, then we are not competent. We flunk the course. We, we, don't, we never learned how to pull teeth. We never learned sanitation. We never learned uh, how to run an office. We never learned whatever else it is they teach you in dental school. We didn't learn it. We are fooling around. We didn't do our homework. It comes up and they give us a test. Now this guy, he, he, he couldn't, you know, he couldn't take care of a cat, let alone a human being. He doesn't do anything. He doesn't even floss his own teeth. He, he's just not in the business. You're going to give him a diploma by grace? Well, now, when God speaks, and we were in Revelation here, and then we're through here, to him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He's talking about a kingdom like David's. He's talking about people ruling in countries, like in Mexico and Brazil and in, and in uh, the Middle East and in Europe and in Iceland, and in all these other places. Don't forget that all these nations are stratified by time. You, you've got a generation, so you're going to have to have several people ruling over Iceland because they'll be ruling over Icelanders at different periods of history. Don't you see that? However that works, that's going to work that way. Well, there won't be room. There'll be room. God will make room. When he, everyone who overcomes will rule the nations. That's what the Lord said. And it'll be a rule like David of righteous people. But these will be people who have learned to rule, who are competent to rule, who have overcome. Now, what God, now you see how the, uh, what a blessing that was to Zechariah? He said, oh, what good thing is coming? God is going to give us the throne of David. Not that we're going to go up with uh, uh, golden slippers. God is going to give us the throne of David. Hallelujah, isn't this wonderful? We'll be free from our enemies. He's going to come and rule and we won't be bothered and we can serve him all the days of our life. Uh, Zechariah was a priest. It said concerning him and his wife, they walked in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. All he wanted to do was serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness. And he says, oh, praise the Lord. A righteous king is coming. We'll be able to serve him in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. And that is what the body of the Messiah is going to do. Behold my servant whom I have chosen. He shall bring justice to the nations. Are you ready? So hallelujah. I'm all excited because, you know, it is a tremendous challenge. We've got to, uh, little by little, if we're going to start in Mexico, we're going to start in Mexico. We're going to start wherever God's going to open a door. But somewhere it's got to be fed into the bloodstream of the body of Christ. Hey, this is not some trip up to, with golden slippers and harps and mansions. This is the throne of David. This is the house of Jacob. And we Gentiles are the children of God scattered abroad. And we're going to be brought back into that one holy nation. And we are going to rule this crazy world, shall we stand? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hiki Siri Alawahanda Lalawahashiri Alawahanda.